A few weeks ago, I attended uh, one of these things called Foo Camp, um, which I uh, found out was the campers themselves come up with what happens on the schedule. And there's basically a grid that people mob at a certain key moment, an empty grid of things you might want to talk about in parallel, and then different time slots going down, like a spreadsheet. And uh, people put up various suggestions for various rooms. And uh, I went to put up my suggestion in a, uh, a row that looked curiously empty. There was only one thing in the row, in one room, called Wolfram Alpha. And I didn't know what it was, but I put my modest little proposal for whatever my session was going to be next to it. And somebody immediately took me aside and told me that that was not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I put my tail between my legs and moved my sticky to another box. And uh, after attending myself then, uh, what occurred in that little block, the Wolfram Alpha demo, uh, I can see why. Uh, I was pleased to have been able to meet uh, Stephen Wolfram, who's here, uh, a gentleman who is simultaneously terrifically unassuming and approachable, and at the same time, from what I can tell, one of the most ambitious and ambitiously minded people I've ever met. Uh, the demo that I saw was really interesting. It got me thinking, uh, among other things, about the role of the university and what we are here at universities to do and how we're supposed to do, I, I hate the phrase knowledge management, but knowledge management, otherwise known as learning. And uh, it seemed to me that the kind of project that Stephen has undertaken here, something that uh, if it works, uh, has a real quality of marvel to it, um, is something that is achieved one step at a time, one data flow at a time, as you'll see. So I'm going to turn it over to him, let him explain his project, how it started, how it works, uh, do a little bit of a demo, and then we'll just open it up to a conversation. There are a number of people watching on the webcast, and there are means for those on the webcast to be able to ask questions back. And at key moments, we may also turn over to our webcast representative bench here, uh, who will share what's going on uh, in the outside world. So with no further ado, uh, let me uh, welcome, and please join me in welcoming Stephen Wolfram. Thanks very much. Well, I want to tell you about a tremendously ambitious project that, uh, that we've been working on. It's, uh, it's actually a project that I've been thinking about for a very long time. It's uh, probably about once a decade I've wondered whether it was finally time to really start trying to do this project. In the past, I've always concluded that it was hopeless. Um, but a few years ago, I, I decided that it was finally time to actually try doing this project. So here's the goal. The goal is to sort of find a way to make the systematic knowledge that we've accumulated in our civilization computable, to find a way to take sort of all that data that's out there and uh, all the mo models and methods and so on that we know and somehow combine them to be able to compute whatever can be computed about the world. Well, it's a pretty big project. Um, but uh, what, I, what I realized was that the state of technology and the web and so on, and in particular, two big projects that I've spent the past quarter century or so doing, finally made this project not completely crazy. So I've, I've worked on Mathematica now for 23 years, and what, uh, what that's done is to build up a language, a, a platform for computing formal things and, and for representing things formally. Um, it's been very successful, both practically and intellectually. Um, and in fact, in the last few years, it's been, it's been exciting to see sort of how all the pieces that we've built all these years have fit together to create a, an accelerating sort of recursive pattern of, of growth for the system. So, okay, so we've got a, a really powerful sort of symbolic language for representing things and providing algorithms about things. The other big thing uh, cool. in my life has been my work on NKS, a, a new kind of science, on studying the, the computational universe of possible programs and, and what they do. So NKS has, has shown that it, it really is possible to understand an awful lot of things in the world computationally. And more important, that there are often incredibly simple rules that lead to incredible complexity and, and richness. Well, as I've sort of absorbed that realization, that paradigm, I, I finally got to thinking that perhaps all that knowledge out there might somehow be representable, might be handleable by rules that are simple enough that one could actually build them. So that's what we've been trying to do. It's a, it's a project sort of built with the NKS paradigm with lots of practical ideas from NKS and built on the platform that Mathematica provides. Obviously, it's a huge project, like my previous two projects, uh, which have been running for 23 and 28 years, respectively. This is, this is going to be a very long-term project. But I think we're finally now at the point where we feel okay letting it loose in the world 
And the first instance of the technology that, that uh, we're building is a, is a free website called Ball from Alpha that will be launching in, in just a few weeks. So, well, let me uh, uh, try and uh, show you a little bit of it. So, okay, the, the idea of Wolfram Alpha is uh, essentially you type in a question and Wolfram Alpha types back an answer. Okay, this is encouraging so far. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the first type of questions that we can type in are sort of mathy kinds of questions, like I might type something like this. And I'm typing it in kind of a, a cruddy syntax that doesn't, um, uh, doesn't have much, um, uh, is, is kind of just the, the sort of askification of, of some piece of math. But, but here's the answer, so it tells me there's the, there's the result for the integral. Here are a couple of plots that we might like to see of the, of the integral. Here are some alternative forms of the integral, uh, other kinds of uh, useful facts about the integral. And uh, for the, the students of the world and so on, or if you, if you want to follow along as a human what, uh, what Wolfram Alpha is doing, um, oops, that, that uh, it should, it should, yeah, there we go. The, it, um, uh, it can show us there are some possible steps that you, you as a human could have taken to get to the answer that Wolfram Alpha got to uh, pretty fast there. So, so we can do all kinds of things in this sort of formal mathematical kind of world. We can also kind of jump out into the, into the, the real world of sort of uh, uh, practical facts about the world. So let's say we are say, what's the GDP of France? Um, there's the result, there's a, a plot of uh, the history, and, and here's a, a few other things that we might immediately want to know about GDP, and we press more, we can get to more stuff. Uh, if we want to, we can kind of dress this up. We could say, what is the GDP of France, for example, question mark. Um, and uh, it'll go off and uh, be able to figure out that we're really asking the same question we, we asked before, give us the same answer. Let's maybe say we want to know what's the GDP of France divided by Italy, okay? So we as humans can pretty much tell what that question means, um, and so can it. And because all this data is kind of organized in such a way that it's computable, um, it can immediately work out, okay, it knows this value, it knows that value, it can divide them, it can get the result. We can say show the details, and it'll show us here the, um, uh, the result from that. Okay, or we could say something like, uh, I don't know, internet users in Europe, for instance. Um, and now there'll be a bunch of data that it has about that. Um, and uh, uh, it can, it'll go through and, and look up the data that it has and try and figure out a reasonable way to summarize that data. So it'll tell us the total number of internet users, the country with the highest number. It'll give us some histograms. And then it might give us a table down here of the various countries. We can ask it to show more of those. It's only so 93 on. internet users in Vatican City. So it claims. I guess they have other sources. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we can go and uh, uh, we can go and ask. Um, let, let's say we pick a place. Let's try um, something like Lexington. Um, and uh, oh, I realize. Okay, so that this I'm I'm connected here through a VPN tunnel to um, uh, to a machine at our company headquarters in Illinois. So it thinks I'm in Illinois. If it had thought that I was in Massachusetts, which I am. Uh, it probably would have defaulted to, it should have defaulted to Lexington, Massachusetts. As it is, it just defaulted to Lexington, Illinois, and told me something about Lexington, Illinois. Let's go and tell it uh, we really want to talk about Lexington, Massachusetts here, because that's just down the, down the road from here. So it can tell us a certain amount about Lexington. It says, uh, you know, what the population is. It tells us that some, here are some nearby larger cities. It's telling us it's a, a very uh, uh, toasty 91 degrees in, in Lexington, Massachusetts right now. Um, let's go and uh, ask it. Let's let's ask it a little bit more detail about the um, uh, whoops the the weather in um, Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, so now it'll go and uh, figure that out, um, and it'll tell us. It'll give us a summary at the top. Here's the temperature and so on. Um, then it'll show us a plot of uh, that's the temperature as a function of time for the past week in Lexington, Massachusetts, and it's predicting. Uh, this is uh, from weather forecast. It will, it's predicting for the next few days that's how the temperature will vary with time. Maybe we can go and say, okay, show us the, uh, the last 10 years' worth of weather um, in Lexington, Massachusetts, and there's, uh, there's the result, and you can see that um, uh, it varies every, every year from warmer in the summer to colder in the winter, all those kinds of things. Um, we could, if we wanted to, we could kind of uh, dig in more precisely, and we could say, you know, weather on... Um, uh, let's try something like this, you know, just some random date there. Um, it'll go and uh, hopefully be able to tell us on that particular day what the average temperature was 
Um, there's, the, there's the pattern for the week around that day, and so on. Uh, or we could uh, go ahead and say something like, um, let's say we say something like Lexington, Massachusetts, and then we just type in Moscow here. Um, and it'll, it'll probably, I don't know what, which I, I think it will pick by default the Moscow and Russia, um, and now it'll show us things about a comparison between those two cities. It'll show us you know, how we get from one to the other, um, how far it is, um, those kinds of things. Um, we could go and, uh, um, on the right, we can, uh, it'll give us a, a link to a Wikipedia page, for example, about Lexington, which we could go look at if we wanted kind of a, a more narrative discussion. This is, uh, Wolfram Alpha is really concentrating on giving us you know, just the facts about things. So maybe we can type in something like, uh, we'll give it some unit of measure, let's say you know, five miles per second, for example. And so um, uh, it's, um, uh, uh, we'll, it'll say, okay, there's five miles per second. What, what, uh, one thing it tries to do is to tell us something useful based on the input we gave. So uh, useful things it can tell us are things like, what are some other units that, that might be good to give that speed in? What are some comparisons for that speed that might be useful in terms of understanding roughly what it is? Uh, maybe we could try something else. Let's try 6,000 C, and uh, let's see what it thinks that is. Okay, so it says, assuming that C is a unit, and then assuming it means degrees centigrade, now it can tell us a sort of conversions for 6,000 degrees centigrade. It'll tell us some other useful things, like that's the black body spectrum at 6,000 degrees. That's the color that a black object would be if, if uh, heated to that temperature, um, those kinds of things. Or let's say we ask it, um, say, something like, I don't know, you know $17 an hour. Um, we can uh, now it'll, it'll um, give us a uh, uh, result about that based on um, just giving us sort of convenient conversions um, for, that, uh, for that quantity. Or maybe we could type in something like, uh, you know, 4,000 words if we're writing some essay or something. Um, it'll tell us uh, um, here, are, here are some sort of typical things. We can, we can always drill down and say, show us more stuff here. Um, and, uh, there's, there's the result for, for some other kinds of uh, quantities associated with 4,000 words. Or we could go and say, um, uh, I don't know, we could, we could start asking about materials, like, you know, let's say 333 grams of gold, um, and it'll probably be able to figure out, um, uh, I have to say, I'm a little, little frustrated. It's running a little slower than I'm used to seeing it run. I don't know whether that's because of some, some strange uh, condition, but um, uh, anyway, I think when it's... Um, when it's alive in the world, it'll be a tiny bit zippier than this. Um, the, uh, okay, so, so it's telling us um, about, uh, in this case, you know, some number of grams of gold, and it's telling us its value of it's about $10,000 by in, uh, current commodity prices, and here's the heat capacity of that amount of gold, um, all those kinds of things. Um, maybe we can go and, uh, let's say we're doing chemistry, we can say, you know, we could type in some chemical like, you know, uh, H2SO4, and now we could say something like, um, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's say we're making, you know, five molar H2SO4. Um, it can then compute uh, what, um, uh, what you would need to, to make that and it'll tell us, uh, you know, how to prepare something like that. Or we could tell it, um, let's say we typed in something like, uh, well, it knows about lots of kinds of chemicals and so on. So let's say we type in caffeine. Okay, we can always go and, and actually compute things about this, so it'll know all kinds of stuff about caffeine. But we can say, you know, what's the caffeine molecular weight? Or we could say, you know, caffeine molecular weight uh, divided by water, let's say. Um, and it should just give us a result for that. Or we could go and say something like, um, oh, I don't know, we could uh, pick another material, like something like um, uh, decane, let's say. And now we can go and ask it, you know, what is decane? Okay, so there's some basic information about decane. Let's say, what's decane like at uh, two atmospheres and 50 degrees centigrade? Um, and now it'll have to uh, dive in and try and compute uh, from uh, uh, information about that material. It can compute that's the position in the phase diagram. And here are some, uh, uh, some particular properties of the material at that temperature and pressure, um, those kinds of things. Or let's, uh, let's pick another area. Let's, let's do something, let's say something medical. So let's say we go, you know, we say LDL 180. So, you know, that might be a result from some medical test that somebody's been reported. Um, and this will now kind of dive into some public health study. Um, and it'll say, uh, okay, if your LDL level is 180, that means that you're at the 95.9 percentile of the population. 
But now we could, we could kind of slice that a little bit more. We could say, you know, male age 40 or something. Um, and now it'll go and take that public health study and it'll go and slice down in the public health study and look specifically for the subpopulation that matches the, those criteria. And now it'll say, okay, so for that subpopulation, you're just at the 92nd percentile. Or maybe we could say, um, uh, let's say something like, uh, we want to know what's the LDL level versus uh, serum potassium level. And notice that the stuff I'm typing in is in kind of, uh, uh, I can type in sort of hopefully, um, type in kind of expert speak um, for, this, for this field. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't have to sort of spell everything out. Okay, so here it's giving us the comparison between uh, LDL levels, potassium levels. It's probably gonna show us, well, there isn't a lot of correlation it seems there, but, but uh, it's showing us the, uh, the correlation that there might be between those two uh, medical tests. Or we could go and um, let's try something else. Let's try um, something like uh, life expectancy. Uh, you know, male age 40 in Italy, let's say. Um, and we could go and uh, now it'll go and uh, look at um, data on that. And it tries to tell us something that um, it tries to sort of give us useful information based on what it can compute about that. So there's <coughs> distributions of survival curves and so on. Uh, there's a curve of the history of that life expectancy as a function of time, and that's probably some frozen history of probably a couple of wars there um, that cause it to, to go down. Um, and we could maybe, actually, let's, let's go and just say, let's ask about a specific year here. Let's say, what was the life expectancy for a male age 40 um, in 1933? And, oh, okay, so it, it, there's some subtlety to this because it says, assuming 1933 is the year of the data, which means the year of death, use it as the year of birth for the person instead. So maybe we can click that saying, let's use it as the year of birth instead, and now it'll give us a, a, a different number based on, on uh, uh, people age 40 born in 1933. Well, we can go and let's look at some other kinds of things. I mean, there's lots of different stuff that one can compute about the world. So let, let's say, um, uh, let's type in something like this. It's probably gonna guess that that's a specification of a person, um, and uh, now it'll be able to tell us things like, um, how does that uh, height and weight lie within the distribution of, of body mass index and, and all sorts of other things um, based on that, that input? Uh, maybe we can try a different thing. Let's, let's keep on with a sort of biological theme. Let's say I type in something like this. Um, see what we can figure out about that. Um, okay, so it'll go and dive into the human genome and uh, it'll be able to uh, figure out what, um, uh, where that particular sequence um, matches on the reference human genome. So you can see it has a, a few matches on chromosome one and uh, goes and scrolls down. There are all the various matches. Let's pick one of these genes, I don't know, MSH3, whatever that might be. I've never heard of it, but um, uh, let's say we, we ask it, uh, we could say, tell us the properties of, of gene MSH3, or we can say something like, you know, let's see what happens, 567 base pairs upstream of uh, that gene MSH3, see whether it can figure out how to do that. Um, so, okay, so there it, it, um, it's going that number of base pairs upstream and it's saying what's on the human genome, that number of base pairs upstream, and there's sort of a picture of the, the local environment of the human genome there. Um, or let's pick a, another kind of uh, random string of letters. Let's, um, let's go to a ticker symbol for a stock, for example, um, and now it'll, it'll be able to tell us something about, uh, it'll give us the real-time quote for that stock. It'll give us a bunch of fundamentals data about the stock. Um, all sorts of uh, performance information. Um, somewhere down here will probably show us uh, like a, a projection. You know, this is, it's not as good as weather forecasting and so on, but you can get uh, kind of based on historical volatility, you can get some kind of projection for what, uh, um, what the stock might do. Um, or we can, let's say we type, uh, you know, MSFT and sun, for example. Um, sun might mean, you know, the thing in the sky, but here because it's, uh, uh, next to something that's about stocks, it'll figure out that it probably means a stock, and it's going to say it's going to assume it's Sun Microsystems rather than other Sun named stocks. And now it'll give us uh, this is sort of a typical thing in Morphin Alpha. You can get uh, if you have several entities, it will automatically give you a comparison between the the uh, the uh, uh, properties of those entities. So we can go, we could drill down if we want to, and look at lots of detailed financial data about these companies, and we can see uh, all sorts of comparisons and so on here. Well, we could also go and uh, start computing things. Let's say we're interested in mortgages. We can go and say, you know, a 5% 20-year mortgage. Um, we can now go and, uh, oh, it'll need to know here um, what, uh, what's the loan amount. So let's say we say, um, let's pick something else. Let's say it's 200,000 euros, for instance. Um, 
now it'll go and compute things based on, based on that um, and uh, give us a result here and tell us uh, things like uh, you know, the table of monthly payments or all those kinds of things. Uh, maybe we can, uh, let's, let's get more elaborate here. Let's, let's make this an adjustable rate mortgage, which just will make things a bit more complicated. Um, and then there are all kinds of different options of things that you can sort of add, different criteria, you, different uh, sort of uh, details you can add. But here's kind of, uh, here's some basic information on this adjustable rate mortgage and various simulations of, of what would happen in different scenarios, those kinds of things. And we can go and do all sorts of fancy uh, kind of um, uh, quanti kinds of uh, computations too. Well, let's say we type in something else. Let's say we say, you know, something like $2.25. Okay, pretty easy to understand what that is. Um, of course, what that particular piece of input means depends on where we're coming from. So, for example, if we were coming from Mexico, that same symbol uh, would mean something different. And we can kind of pretend that we're coming from Mexico by just sort of typing in some little cheat code here. Um, and uh, now, uh, by default, what it'll assume is that that dollar sign 225 means Mexican pesos, um, and it'll show us uh, results about that. We could tell it, okay, have this assume we actually mean U.S. dollars instead, um, and now it'll uh, uh, figure out some useful things to tell us. Like it'll tell us there's the U.S. dollar thing, there's the uh, there's the local currency, there's uh, the historical conversions, um, those sorts of things. Um, well, we can go and do all kinds of computations in all kinds of areas. Let's say, for example, we might, um, let's say something like this. That's, a, that's an airfoil specification from aeronautical engineering. Um, and uh, uh, here it'll compute um, properties of, uh, the engineering properties of that, um, that thing. Maybe I can fill in here. Let's tell it um, I want it at a 15 degree angle. Um, so let's, uh, let's just put that there. And now it'll redo this computation um, for uh, a different configuration and work out the, uh, the, at least the potential flow around this, um, uh, uh, this kind of airfoil. Or we might, um, let's jump into a completely different area. Let's say we type in something like, you know, D sharp minor, okay? Um, we can uh, then, um, it'll uh, uh, decide that that's about some kind of musical thing. We could even, um, let's see if this works here. We can even say, you know, play the sound. See if this works. May work, may not work. Okay, not too exciting, but but uh, um, it could uh, play that scale. Or we could say something like, you know, jumping into some other kind of area. We could say something like uh, red plus yellow. Okay, and now it'll uh, figure out that. Um, okay, we can add those two colors together. We get uh, orange, and here's some information about. Um, uh, things like um, uh, how you would enter that on an HTML page, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Or maybe we could go, um, uh, let's try something like this. We could uh, think about a website, so something like the, the Apple main website. It'll think that's an a, uh, internet domain. Okay, there's the number of daily page views, things like that. We can look at uh, what's the history of page views there. And um, okay, probably Apple had some exciting event right then um, that caused a spike in its traffic. Or we could go and uh, let's try, try and take a look. Um, uh, let's look at a university. Let's say, I don't know why, let's, let's try Stanford University, okay? Um, we can, uh, now we'll know uh, quite a bit of stuff about Stanford University. We'd know things like, uh, you know, how many students it has, uh, you know, how many people got PhDs in, uh, in education at Stanford last year, all these kinds of details. And we can go and ask specifically for this information if, if we want to and do comparisons and, and generate plots and all those sorts of things. Or we could, uh, let's pick another area. Let's, I don't know, let's try an occupation. Let's say lawyers, just for you know, You're very kind. thematic yeah. relevance. The, the, uh, so it'll say, assuming it's an occupation, okay, so it's gonna tell us a certain amount about um, uh, the, the current uh, uh, employment for, for lawyers in, in the US. So we could perhaps say um, uh, something, maybe this will work, I'm not sure. Um, if we say, um, what's the median wage, and maybe they'll be able to compute. Let's see what it does, okay. So it has at least a few years of data of uh, uh, the trend on something like that. Um, or, you know, we can dive into pretty detailed stuff about, um, about lots of kinds of areas. So, you know, I don't know, if we say how much, how much fish is produced in France in a year, right? It'll tell us, uh, you know, such and such a number of metric tons. There's a plot of the last few years. 
Uh, if we go down, it'll tell us, you know, conversion. So it's saying about 57 pounds of fish per second on average are produced, and that's, uh, that's about one-fifth the rate at which trash is produced in New York City, these, these, these types of things. Um, the, uh, what percentage uh, of the trash is fish? That's a, that's a good question. I, I doubt that that's a, uh, I doubt anybody has actually measured that. So, um, now we can, we can say something like, uh, you know, what's uh, production of fish in France versus Poland? And now it'll, it'll try and tell us things like what are the relative, uh, how can we sort of visualize the relative values of, of, uh, of those quantities, things like that. Or let's, uh, let's jump into a completely different area. Let's say, you know, we are, uh, let's say, you know, two cups of orange juice or something. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll tell us it should be able to synthesize the nutrition label for that. Um, it'll, uh, it'll be able to tell us, you know, in, in orange juice, Vitamin C is very, uh, it's a very big thing, and you know there's thiamine and potassium and so on. We could drill down and say, what are some other things that sort of occur unusually much in, in orange juice? Um, and uh, maybe we could show here how does orange juice compare to the distribution of all common foods? Where, where what percentile rank is it at for those, uh, uh, for those things and so on? Or we could say, I don't know. Let's imagine, um, uh, let's say, you know, something like this: one slice cheddar cheese, let's say, um, let's see if that works. Um, okay, so it could figure out, so now it'll, it'll synthesize a nutrition label for that uh, uh, sort of composite food there, it's a slightly peculiar one, but um, uh, that's, um, okay, so now, you know, let me jump into another kind of area, let's say um, we say something like this, um, that's kind of the, uh, uh, it'll assume that, 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 oh, that happens to be a single word, okay, I, I um, uh, I don't know. Let's let's uh, give it another blank there. See what that does. Um, so th this is this is now sort of doing the the crossword puzzle, word puzzle like thing of uh, matching words in English to this. Or we could go. Um, let's say uh, let's look at something like you know Mount Everest or something. Um, and we could say that it'll it'll know things about Mount Everest. You know like <coughs> what are some nearby towns, nearby mountains, things like that. But we could also just say specifically say you know height of Mount Everest, and then maybe we can say divided by length of Golden Gate Bridge, just to pick things from two different kinds of uh, areas. So now it'll it'll know those two numbers, and it'll be able to just divide them and and uh, get a result. Or let's uh, try another kind of thing. Let's try some people. Okay, so let's say. You know, Alan Turing and Kurt Gödel, two, two fine, fine chaps. Um, and now it'll give us some information um, about, uh, uh, about those people, a little bit of sort of computable data about those people, a little timeline of, of when they lived, um, those sorts of things. Or maybe we could say something like, um, we could really sort of combine things together and we could say something like uh, weather in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, when Kurt Gödel died. Let's see whether that works. Um, okay, take a little while to figure this out. See whether this works. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> average temperature 30 degrees Fahrenheit, etc. Um, we could uh, let, let's try something completely different. Let's say uh, let's jump into another area. Let's say um, we're interested in some kind of genealogy kind of thing. Let's say um, uh, grandson's son, something like that. Um, now it'll it'll compute the. Uh, the kind of the family tree, and it can com it can figure out things like uh, what's the probability that uh, different pieces of genetic material are shared between those two uh, uh, those two two people, um, those sorts of things. Um, or we can go and uh, sort of slice down all kinds of data, so we can say you know fifth largest country in Europe, for example, and we can we can ask these kinds of questions about what's the um, uh, what's the nth largest, or you know, what's the things with a boiling point greater than such and such? Those those sorts of things. And here it'll say, you know, where's the result by area, by population, and so on. Or we could say something like, uh, I don't know, GDP versus railway length in Europe. Um, let's try something like that. Um, see whether that works. Okay. Oh, that didn't do quite what I expected. I thought it would make a nice um, uh, a nice plot of those two. Oh well. Um, it didn't. It probably, uh, I'm probably used to the absolutely latest version of Wolfram Alpha, which is about uh, a week later than the, than the thing that I'm, uh, <laughs> that I'm showing you here. Um, let's, uh, let's try something like, um, I don't know, we can drill into another area. Let's try um, some, some random piece of uh, meteorological history. Okay, so we'll have data on uh, 
some hurricane, we could say, uh, let's you know, look at more, let's drill down, let's get some more data about that. If I press that button, did I press that button? No. Um, and uh, uh, there we see that. Let's say, let's, let's just try the, the name Andrew. Okay, what do we get if we type a, a name? Um, well, then it knows that that's, uh, so it knows I'm coming from the US, it has data on US births. So it says, it uh, looks like there was a, a giant um, Andrew peak somewhere in the, uh, uh, in the late 1980s, looks like. And actually, it can figure out, um, based on that Andrew peak and based on mortality curves, it can figure out, given that you're throwing a, a random Andrew today, what's, the, uh, what's their likely age? So it says there's a, yeah. there's a peak <laughs> of around uh, 25 years old, and there's about, um, uh, let's maybe, let's compare it with, uh, how, how about we'll put in a, um, let's see about that. Just, uh, um, okay, so there, oh, look, there, there's the this time. Yeah, right. The, it's, um, okay, so there's actually the Jonathans and the Andrews really tracked each other there. Um, <laughs> look at that. Okay. The um, uh, different names have very different uh, kinds of uh, signatures. So, or we can ask something like, you know, we can say, you know, it's easy to ask something like, you know, who was the 18th president of the U.S.? That's just sort of something you could look up. But let's say, you know, who was the president of Brazil in 1922, for example? That's something that requires a little bit of... Uh, uh, figuring out from the data um, who was the who was the person um, uh, there at that time, or we can do another kind of thing. We could let's say we could say you know what's the um, what's the tide in New York City on um, uh, some particular day, and this is something where we where we're both uh, we have to uh, bring in data about sort of general tide data, and then we have to actually compute uh, what the tide will be like at this particular time in the future. Or we could do, uh, there's all sorts of things you can compute. I mean, let's say, you know, 10 flips for heads or something. So we can kind of guess that that's about coins and so can it, and it'll tell us, you know, what's the probability for that, uh, for that particular configuration. Or we could do something like, uh, let's do another mathy kind of thing. Let's say we type in some sequence. Let's say, um, let's see if I can think of a, a good sequence here. So let's say we do something like this, and we say, so what's the next term in that sequence? Um, so it can figure out, okay, there's a plot of that sequence, and now it figures out possible closed form for that sequence is some 2 to the n plus 1 thing, and here's how it might continue, and there's some other kinds of mathy things that can be said about that sequence. Or maybe we could just type in some, you know, random, oops, some random number here, um, see what it concludes about that. Um, it'll probably try and figure out from that number what are some possible closed forms for that number in terms of constants and other kinds of things that it knows. Or if we really, I don't know how many math type people there are here, but there's, uh, there's lots of depth in these kinds of places that one can compute things, like here's a, um, here's a, a knot. Or we could, we could ask it uh, something like, you know, what's the um, next, uh, how about this, next total solar eclipse. Um, and oh, it'll, it'll think I'm in Champaign, Illinois, so that's okay. But it, it tells me anyway, there's a, um, oh, that's the next total solar eclipse after today in the world. Um, it, there's, the, uh, there's the one, and there's the, the path that it'll take. Let's say, let's try typing Chicago or something. Um, and now it'll try and figure out, I think, whether what's the next total solar eclipse that will be visible from Chicago. Um, and it says it's about 15 years from now. So, um, or we can, do, uh, we can do all kinds of things. I don't know. We, we can, uh, can keep going for a really long time showing you different kinds of things that Wolfram Alpha can do. Here's, here's another example. This is, uh, um, so... Here's, uh, like, I type in ISS, and it'll assume that's a spacecraft. There's, I guess there's also an airport with that acronym. And now it'll figure out um, it has a, a real-time feed for, for orbital elements for spacecraft, and then it can solve the equations for uh, the motion of a spacecraft in the Earth's gravitational field and can tell us that the ISS is now going at 17,000 miles an hour, and it appears to be uh, over China. <coughs> Come back in a few minutes, it'll probably be somewhere different. It'll tell us uh, from... From Champaign, Illinois, it's not visible right now, but it'll next rise at 1.14 a.m. Uh, tomorrow. So, okay, well, we can... Um, uh, ah, interesting problem, okay. Um, we, can, um, we can do all kinds of things uh, with Wolfram Alpha. Here's sort of a, uh, a rough list of uh, a few kind of sample areas that, that, uh, uh, that we've... Um, uh, <coughs> We've, we've worked on so far, um, but uh, I, I've sort of given you an indication of a few kinds of uh, directions that, that, um, that Wolfram Alpha goes in. 
maybe I should say a little bit um, about sort of uh, more generally about what is this technology? What, what's inside this thing? Um, what, what can it do? What, what do we expect it to do in the future? Um, I mean, the first thing to realize about it is that, that we're, we're trying to compute things. I mean, when you think about the web and so on, you think about all the information that's available on the web, we now have very impressive tools, search engines and so on, that allow us to go and find anything that's been explicitly written down before uh, somewhere on the web. Um, what we, but, but that's, and, and sort of however fragmented the information is, if somebody explicitly wrote down a particular thing on the web, we can go find that. But when we have a particular question that we're asking that involves sort of our particular value of something or our particular place or whatever else, uh, the likelihood that we'll find the answer to that particular question just explicitly written down on the web goes way down. What we're trying to do with Wolfram Alpha is to take those kinds of things that can be computed about the world, given all the data that's been accumulated about the world, um, and uh, given all of the methods and models and equations and formulas and so on that um, uh, have been created from, from science and engineering and all sorts of forms of analysis, take all of that stuff that, uh, that we sort of know about how to compute things and try and package it to the point where uh, we can actually sort of just walk up to a website and ask some question and have it generate the knowledge that, that we want to have. Sort of the, the objective is to reach sort of expert level knowledge across a very wide range of domains, across sort of everything where, where you can compute things and have it be the case that sort of like interacting with an expert, it will kind of understand what you're talking about, do the actual computation, and then get, be able to sort of present to you results sort of formatted and presented in such a way that, that you should be able to understand um, what, the, uh, what the consequences are. So, I mean, in terms of what's inside this thing, they're really, they're, they're four big, big sort of pieces to the, what's needed to create Wolfram Alpha. The first thing is data curation. Uh, Wolfram Alpha has, has trillions of pieces of curated data. So what that means is uh, we're getting data from uh, uh, both from sort of uh, free data, licensed data, all sorts of kinds of data. Some of it is fairly static data. A lot of it is data that uh, comes from feeds that uh, come into to our system. And we're taking this data and we're running it through this kind of uh, partially automated, partially human process of sort of correlating different sources of data, trying to verify the data, trying to set it up so that it's well organized and, and clean and computable. And so that's one of the things we found in our sort of, uh, uh, we kind of built this industrial data curation pipeline. And what we found is a lot can be done automatically. We have lots of great mathematical programs that analyze data in all kinds of ways. At some point, you need a, a human domain expert in the middle of it. And we're lucky enough that within our company, we've got uh, experts in lots of kinds of things. And we have kind of an extended network of, of outside folk who've been very helpful to us in sort of providing expertise in a, in a wide range of different areas. So, so the sort of the first component here is curated data, being able to sort of uh, take data from lots of different places, uh, clean it up, make it computable, organize it so that we can really count on it and expect to build things on the basis of it. So a second big component um, is the actual algorithms, the computations that go on inside. Um, and those are uh, the, the, um, what's, what we're trying to do there is to take sort of all methods, models, equations, et cetera, from all different areas and actually implement them in, in the Mathematica code that lies inside Wolfram Alpha so that we can actually uh, do computations um, about all sorts of things. And there are, uh, it's, the good news is it's sort of there are a finite number of methods and models and so on that have been discovered in kind of the, the history of, of science and engineering and so on. Um, they're still uh, not a small number, and mm -hmm. by now, uh, the, in, the inside Wolfram Alpha is about five or six million lines of Mathematica code that implement all of those uh, uh, methods and models and so on. So that's sort of the second component of, of Wolfram Alpha is this implementation of actual algorithms and computations. Uh, the third component is the linguistic analysis that we have to do to understand the inputs. Kind of the idea of Wolfram Alpha is there's no manual, there's no documentation. You get to interact with it just as you think about uh, things. And so what we need to do there is to sort of solve the problem of taking free form, natural human language and being able to interpret it. Now, obviously, natural language processing has been a, a long, uh, long sought after goal. Um, what we get to do is something a little bit different. It's sort of the opposite, in a sense, of uh, what um, 
uh, people have traditionally been, been aiming for with natural language processing, kind of the traditional approach, traditional problem has been, you know, you're throwing a million pages of, of flowing perfect uh, text and you're asked, you ask for your computer to understand that text. We have sort of the opposite problem. There's a certain set of kind of symbolic uh, representations of, of things that we can compute with and we're asking whether these particular utterances from humans can be mapped into things that we can actually compute with. So it's a different problem. It's one that has had much less uh, uh, attention. Um, I don't know whether it's an easier problem. All I know is that we've uh, managed to find uh, some good solutions, particularly using some methods that come from NKS and, and uh, other kinds of things. We've managed to find uh, a surprisingly successful solutions to, to the problem of being able to understand even quite short utterances in even kind of the jargon of very specialized fields. I actually thought one of the many things that could have gone wrong with this project is that uh, uh, by the time you get to the kind of short, lazy things that people actually type in, that there will be huge amounts of ambiguity in what people were actually talking about. Um, that's turned out not to be nearly as much of a problem as, as we had expected, and it's been possible to really disentangle uh, what people mean um, when, when we're mapping it onto the sort of symbolic representation that we can deal with. So kind of the final uh, uh, component, so it's sort of the third component of, of Orphan Alpha is this uh, linguistic understanding component. Uh, the fourth component is really the, the ability to automate presentation of things. So uh, we can compute all kinds of things about some particular area. We might be able to compute a thousand different things. We might be able to produce uh, you know, tens of thousands of possible graphs. The question is what do you actually want to show people so that they can kind of cognitively grasp um, what, the, uh, uh, what, um, what you're trying to communicate. And so there's a whole other uh, sort of kind of technology that's this kind of algorithmic presentation technology um, that sort of tries to pick out what's important. And that's something that, again, requires domain expertise, requires humans to be in the loop, requires heuristic algorithms, requires kind of this approach that we call computational aesthetics that we've worked on in Mathematica for, for many years of being able to sort of optimize the presentation of, uh, for example, graphical data. So, so these, are, these are really the, the, the sort of the four pieces um, to, to Wolfram Alpha, the, the data curation, the internal sort of algorithms and computation, uh, the linguistic understanding, and the automated presentation. Those are, those are the things that we sort of have to pull together to make this work. They're also, it's a, it's a big complicated practical thing, and, and when it goes live, uh, it'll be running on you know, 10,000 CPUs, and it's lots of parallel computation, and uh, you know, when you send a, a query in, it's spread out across a bunch of machines using Grid Mathematica, and all sorts of other uh, fancy kind of state-of-the-art software engineering kinds of things that have to go into it. Um, but sort of at, at a, uh, uh, but, but that's sort of, the, those are the components in terms of the, the underlying technology. Um, so, it's, it's our, this is, uh, uh, this is a project that um, uh, I was not sure whether it was possible. Um, in fact, I'm a little surprised that it's worked out as well as it has. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's something that um, uh, we're, in a sense, just at the beginning. Um, I think we've got to the point where uh, if we kind of go into the typical reference libraries, for example, and I look around at the different shelves and so on, I can say, okay, you know, that block, we've got a, a pretty good start on that block, that one we're, you know, we've, we're, we're decently through, and I think probably 90% probably of the shelves in a typical reference library, we can say we've at least got a reasonable start on. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of um, where we're at with it. Um, I think uh, we can, um, uh, well, it'd be more fun to, to hear from people here what um, uh, um, I can, please, yes. Hi, I'm Andy Oram. I work for O'Reilly Media. I write a, a lot about policy technology. And I wonder um, what you've done about the inconsistencies in data. You say you massage it or curate it a bit, but we don't know how reliable the data is. It would help to know how, how much inconsistency there was when you took it in, and we don't know how reliable the algorithm is. It would be kind of nice to have a box at the bottom saying you, you can trust it this much based on the algorithm we used and the, the inconsistencies perhaps in the incoming data. Right, right. So I mean, the first thing we, we try to do is to give some kind of general source information for, for data that for which there is a meaningful source. I mean, if it's you know, mathematical kinds of data, the, the sources might be nice for, you know, for referencing and, and being nice to one's friends, so to speak, but it's not relevant in terms of whether it's, whether it's right or wrong. 
for, for sort of data, real world data, we try and always give some kind of source information pop up at the bottom that, that kind of gives a general indication of where the data is from. The, you know, what, we're, what we end up doing, what we're trying to do is to create sort of an authoritative source for data. And you know, it's kind of like a big encyclopedia project, um, something, something like that. And what we're doing is we're trying to do our, the best job we can at taking all these different possible sources of data and correlating them and coming up with the best value we can come up with. We may get it wrong, but you know, we, are, you know, we're, we like to think of ourselves as being able to provide something authoritative. We can then give references to sort of upstream authorities um, that uh, uh, we use to get sort of the raw material that we used. But in practice, or at least in principle, you're committed to, if there is data massaging going on, to being able to express to the user what massaging has happened? Well, so what we, the, the, the level of that that we can deal with is we, we know about you know, ranges of values for things. So for example, if there's some piece of data and there, you know, there isn't just one definite value, there's a range of values, we will certainly deal with that. And we can carry that around in a computation. The problem is, by the time you've got a lot of footnotes on a number, you can't do a hell of a lot with that number. You know, the, the difficulty is, I mean, we've seen this actually in, in Mathematica, um, you know, it's really good to have a definite number. You can then do all kinds of computations based on that definite number. If you have a, an interval, you can do a certain amount. If you start saying, let's break it into this complicated distribution, pretty soon you, it degenerates into, well, we can't really say very much based on this. I mean, if, if what you're trying to do is to just uh, dig down to get one unmassaged, uncomputed with number, then you can say, what was the source of this data? What is its precise provenance and so on? But by the time it's actually gone through a non-trivial computation, there's no good human way to describe what's happening. I suppose in something like weather, uh, average temperature in London might be measured at 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., and average temperature in Boston might be measured at midnight and noon, and right, so, concave. Right, so, so I mean, we try and give footnotes that kind of indicate um, as best, I mean, like for example, if we say, you know, weather in London, for example, um, it'll, it'll undoubtedly, you know, it'll give us some data about this, and it'll undoubtedly say somewhere at the bottom, um, it'll say, uh, okay, it'll probably give weather station comparisons. So there are several weather stations that are in different places, and it's going to tell us the, uh, the current temperature of those different weather stations. It probably asks for more weather stations here. <coughs> so that kind of gives us, you know, whenever there's something like that where there's some, um, uh, um, uh, you know, where, where there's some uncertainty, we try and, and do a good kind of, uh, in a sense, scholarly job of saying what's going on. So for example, it says here, sorted by distance and inferred reliability. So what's going on is the top weather station was the one that was closest while being reasonably reliable. There might be an amateur weather station just down the street that is not so reliable. We typically won't choose that. We'll typically choose one that has higher reliability but is slightly further away, so long as the altitude difference isn't too high, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it gets, it gets pretty footnoty pretty quickly. Um, I mean, I think that you know, the thing to realize about, well, we could, uh, lots more things. Okay, go ahead, yes. Christopher Alberg, Independent. Uh, the, you know, the idea of shortcutting between analysis tool and data set is beautiful. I just love that. Having been the analysis tool business is fantastic. Now, how can you say timely? So right now, it would be fantastic with swine flu to have the latest data in there. And I would assume that you're, by launch, will have all the swine flu data on, on the planet. But give it, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that people would like to keep current. And how, how, how do you deal with that? Right. So, so I mean, what, we're, what we hope is that many people, I mean, we've already seen this. Um, you know, people like the idea of what we're doing. Lots of people have data. They've spent a lot of effort collecting this data. They would like to see this data made as easily available to as broad a range of people as possible. Uh, we hope to make a, a streamlined, formalized way for people to contribute data. Um, the challenge is uh, we need to, uh, we want to curate this data. We want to audit the data. We want to be convinced that we can sort of stand by this data because we're really, you know, we're, we're, we're standing by the data that, that we put in here. Um, so the, the idea will be that there will be a, a mechanism for people to contribute data, um, a mechanism for us to audit that data, and so on, and uh, hopefully to flow quite quickly into the system. Um, but yes, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're keenly interested in, in, um, uh, in all forms of data and uh, uh, you know, look forward to working with people in lots of different areas to, to put things in. Other questions? I, it looks uh, looks fantastic. Um, David Weinberger. A, I'm David Weinberger. This is a, more or less a follow-on. Um, to what extent, in what other ways can you open this up, or will you open this up uh, either in terms of, let's say, uh, API access, 
um, or the ability of people to add their own um, amusing comparisons, the garbage fish comparison, and the rest of it. Right. So, so those are two slightly different things. So in terms of APIs. Also uh, metadata. A third, let me add a, a third openness here, the openness of the metadata standards that you're using. Okay. So, um, you know, Wolfram Alpha, when it, when it comes out in a few weeks, um, its first instance is as a thing for humans to interact with. Of great interest is also the ability for programs to interact with it through, you know, what an API. Um, and there will be a variety of levels of API. So um, uh, the, um, uh, the first level of API is basically a sort of presentation level API where people can take pieces of Wolfram Alpha output and embed them on websites. Um, the sort of second level of API is kind of a symbolic level API where people can take the underlying XML that uh, from which all the stuff that you see on the web uh, on these pages is constructed and can get those lumps of XML and mash them up however they want. And kind of there's a third level of API where people can get sort of individual numbers or individual results uh, from both the data bases that we have and, the, and the, the data that we have and from the computations that we have. And there might even be, if we're very lucky, let's see. Um, there might be, uh, uh, let's see. Um, is, uh, um, might even be there. Let's see if there's a first draft. We'll find out if there's a first draft. Oh, look at that. Preliminary, March 27th. Okay, there's, the, there's at least a first draft of the API documentation here. So that, that, that's a good sign that there's really going to be an API. You had a chance to read that, right? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, but, you know, one of the things that's very helpful to us in terms of, in terms of setting up um, uh, API kinds of things is that just sort of everything is done in Mathematica. This, this actual output is uh, sort of a rendered version of a Mathematica notebook. Um, and in fact, you can, you can take this output and uh, that you can get a PDF version of this output or you can get a live Mathematica version of this output. Um, so the structure, when I say you can get it as XML, for us, what you're really getting it at is the symbolic expressions that Mathematica uh, is based on, which are trivially interconvertible with XML. So that's sort of the, the level of API kind, kinds of things. Now, you asked about being able to sort of upload personal data to the system. Uh, it's the intention to have a, a sort of personalizable, professional version of Wolfram Alpha uh, that will have a, a subscription mechanism and so on, and will have the ability for people to upload their own data, both for analysis and for the purpose of knitting some of their own uh, data features into, into the actual computations that are done. Uh, you asked about metadata standards. Um, the, uh, uh, when we open up, as we intend to, kind of our data repository mechanism so that people can contribute data uh, into our data curation pipeline, um, that uh, as, when we do that, some of our ontology, for example, we will be exposing some of our ontology and making that presumably available through you know, RDF and whatever else. Um, for purposes of people to, to sort of uh, provide data in a form that can, can readily be fed into the data curation pipeline. Where should we go next? Um, well, please. Uh, yes, hi, David Burmaster. Um, let's see, in some areas of science, there are truly differences of opinion that have not been settled. I was trying to think of an example of that, but maybe you have one. Uh, my favorite is, uh, would be a question of, are a certain class of chemicals <laughs> called PCBs, are they human carcinogens? And there are some folks who say yes and some folks who say no, but you may have a different example. Right, well, I mean, so what we try to do in cases like this is uh, we try to give a footnote when, you know, when this, I, I was expecting actually something slightly different here. I was expecting that um, if I typed in something about 13 billion years ago, that it would offer me several different, uh, here, maybe if I say something like, you know, redshift um, uh, 7.8 or something, Let's see what it does. Um, okay, so it'll, it'll say, you know, also include dark energy density, you know, use a different universe model. Um, <laughs> um, so we can probably I use, think people uh, were wondering if there was a creationist universe model. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. the, um, but, uh, you know, so we can get, um, uh, so, so the basic thing that we try to do is if there's sort of a difference of, of opinion, so to speak, we, we try to give people, if we can sort of parameterize it appropriately, we try to sort of give people a choice uh, in this little box at the top. You know, do you want to assume the, whatever it is, Lambda CDM universe model, or do you want to assume some other universe model? And if there is a new universe model that comes out, thanks to some discovery at Caltech, is there someone at Wolfram Alpha headquarters that has to say, stop the presses, there's a new universe model, and tweak this search result? Yeah, 
it's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, the, this is a, you know, the goal is to be able to have a, a place where sort of the knowledge that's being generated can be sort of put in computational form and made available for, for everybody. And sort of the idea is, you know, we, we've certainly been trying to work out these questions like at what rate is new knowledge coming in? You know, can we keep up with different kinds of things? Yeah, um, I mean, it's just this vision of these like boiler rooms where you've got people shoveling knowledge into the furnace. <laughs> you know, to an order of magnitude, how many people do you figure will have to wear a Wolfram badge and be shoveling? Well, okay, so we obviously have tried to work this out. Um, you know, I think th this project has actually been done by a surprisingly small number of people. I mean, for most of the history of this project, last few years, it's been about 100 people. It's now about 250 people. Mm. Um, it's probably, you know, to, to kind of continue growing at the kind of rate and to sort of expand out and deal with all the things that people are, are very nicely, you know, offering to us, it's probably going to end up being 1,000 people or something. Mm. Um, the, uh, the thing that, um, uh, you know, the, this image of, of uh, I have to say, I'm reminded of one of the people who might be watching the webcast, so I should be careful what I say, but one of the people who's been uh, uh, working on this project, um, who, there are many sort of scholarly people who work on this project, but there's one in particular who gets a lot of information from books, and so, uh, you know, basically my, my image of his mode of work is, you know, every morning there's a delivery from the university library of, of, a, new big, books. of a big pile of books. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the day, those ones go back. Next day, another pile come in. Um, you know, that, that's a part of what's been going on in, in, uh, uh, in doing this project. And that's you know, what we expect to, yeah. uh, to continue with. Yes. Uh, Ruben Rodriguez, a 1L at the law school. Um, who do you see using Wolf from Alpha? Um, is it for you know the kid who needs help on his homework, or is this for serious scientists who are looking up facts? Right. So, so I mean, the goal is to make sort of expert level knowledge accessible and available to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Okay. Who needs expert level knowledge about things? You know, experts need it. Um, uh, also, you know, one of the trends in the world tends to be what used to be just relevant to experts at one time. Once it can be exposed for other people to get access to it, um, it's really useful to lots of other people too, so long as it can be presented in a form where they can understand what's going on. Now, clearly there are lots of educational uses for this. I mean, clearly in you know, education of, of all different kinds, uh, people who maybe one day will be experts, so to speak, um, can, can find this useful. Um, I think there will be kind of a, I think there will be various peaks of usage. I think there'll be a bunch of professional users in a bunch of different professions. Um, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, uh, for my particular, you know, incredibly specialized computation, I've, I've got some other tool that can do that. But as soon as they go just a tiny bit away from the thing that they've been specialized in, um, they'll end up saying, gee, it's really useful to be able to have this kind of uniform mechanism for doing the computations I need. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I think is, which I find sort of intellectually rather satisfying about this is, you know, I've been a scientist for many years, right? So, um, and there's all this nifty stuff in science. And I've learned how to compute all kinds of things in science. Um, often, you know, I might not be bothered to compute something um, because, you know, it would take me, you know, if I wanted to work out, you know, what's the angle of the sun at this particular moment in this particular place? If I'm, if I think, given maybe 20 minutes or something, I could actually compute it and get it right, okay? Um, but I probably wouldn't bother, right? And many people, you know, wouldn't actually be able to compute it and get it right. But what, what um, uh, uh, you know, what Wolfram Alpha does is it takes that piece of scientific knowledge and it basically makes it immediately accessible uh, for anybody. Um, and uh, um, I think that one of the things that'll be really nice is that, you know, science has achieved quite a bit in the last however many, you know, 100 years and so on. And, but most people don't really get exposed to what it's achieved most of the time because they can't actually, you know, they need to be professional scientists to actually, um, you know, make use of these things. One of, the, one of the points here is sort of being able to expose more of what's been achieved in science and engineering and so on to a, to a much broader audience. I also have a suspicion that that in itself will induce some interesting research that will get done because people will realize after everybody starts computing things about some particular area, they'll realize, well, it'd be really nice if there was a better model for this. And then somebody will go and figure out a better model, and uh, <coughs> that will be, uh, that will be um, go from there. Yes, please. Bob Lurie, retired. Uh, how, you, how much are you going to charge for this? Or are you going to just have a whole row of advertising? <laughs> it's OK. So, so um, the Buy main your website. sextant now, right? That's the contextual <laughs> yes, advertising right. for this. Right. That's the, uh, um, 
the, the, uh, so the, this website that I've been showing you, this will be a completely free site for anybody, anywhere, anytime. This is a, it's, a, it's a free thing. Um, the, uh, uh, we will have corporate sponsors who will uh, uh, have things on, on the side here. In fact, I'm, uh, they're just the ones for launch are just sort of getting lined up now. And I think they're going to be some kind of nifty things, actually. I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what, uh, uh, what actually shows up on these sidebars. Um, but but uh, primarily, these are, these are sort, of, uh, sort of major brand corporate sponsor kinds of things. Um, there's also, clearly, we know a lot about the specific questions people are asking. And uh, by the time they're sort of drilled down to looking at some particular part of output, um, we know in considerable detail what, what kind of question, what kind of piece of knowledge people want. And one of the things that will certainly happen is there is a lot of kind of vendor type information that will be highly useful to people. And we're trying to figure out what's the right sort of mechanism to ingest uh, vendor information um, and to be able to provide it in an appropriate way on the site. Um, basically, we're sort of separating the uh, sort of the advertising side of things from the informational side of things. And sort of the idea is there's, there's vendor information and there'll probably be quite a bit of sort of service business in, in getting vendor information to the point where it can be fed into the data curation pipeline. Then it sort of will get, go into kind of the, the sort of this wall of, of data auditing between kind of the, the vendor supplied information and what actually shows up on the site. That's, that's kind of the idea um, of how that will work. Now there's also going to be a, a professional version of the site which is sort of intended for people who are really doing systematic computations all the time, who want to upload their own data, who want to store some of their own definitions and so on in, in the system. And that will be a subscription service. Yeah. Please. Hi. So what happens if there is no answer? Like if you type in the 55th largest state in the US or something, does it, or the state of World War III? I don't know. No, let's see, 55th <laughs> largest. It may not be able to, Let, let's do something like, let's do the, um, uh, 300th largest country in Europe. Let's see what that does. I don't know what it will do. Um, okay. In that particular case, it just it just says there's the input interpretation. It gives no result. I actually would have expected it to say something about. And I have a feeling that in the very very latest version, um, it will say something slightly different in a case like that. Um, that's one of the. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to cheat and use the hourly build, which might be completely broken. Um, <laughs> Okay, okay, so there, so there it did something slightly different. It says no known countries. Um, it's a typical kind of thing. The, yes? Esther Hargitay Berkman. So I'd like to go back to the question of data sources. So one of the things you showed us was population of internet users somewhere. And so for certain data sources, they're very agreed upon sources, but for some things there aren't. And I'm just wondering how you're choosing those and this would be especially relevant in a lot of social science questions. Right. So identifying good sources is one of the key problems in, in doing data curation and so on. I mean, if you get a, a lousy source, you do a huge amount of work, and what you get out at the end is garbage. Okay? So sort of source identification is a thing that we, you know, it's the, one of the highest judgment, most important pieces of this whole pipeline. Uh, you know, how do we do it? We try and do the best job we can. We try and have sort of uh, use good judgment, ask experts, um, look around at all possible sources, you know, assess them, um, and then compare. You know, one thing we've often done is we'll get some, some sources and uh, we'll, you know, there'll be some source that maybe is even a, a quite proprietary source that we made arrangements to get and so on. Um, and it'll turn out, you know, we get the source in and we start looking at it and we start, you know, plotting things and visualizing things and it's just full of garbage, you know. Because often what's happened is, I mean, it goes both ways. There are some very well-publicized sources that are pretty bad. There are some ones that, are, there are uh, you know, proprietary ones that are really good. There are ones that are proprietary and nobody's really looked at them very much and so they can't tell there's bad things in them. There are ones that are, you know, uh, sort of clean pu public sources that have been picked over a lot. Um, you know, the U.S. government does a really good job, typically, in, uh, in cleaning the data that, uh, that it makes available. Um, the... Um, I think um, you know, what we try to do, uh, you know, we, we give the information about what our sources are and we try and make the best judgments we can about what sources we choose. You know, it, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, I've personally been on many phone calls with experts in different areas asking uh, sort of kind of pointed questions about whether this such and such a kind of data is even conceivably knowable. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes it tends to crumble 
Um, and you know, the result of that will tend to be this little footnote that gets written um, that says something like, you know, who knows what it says, but you know, says you know, based on uh, you know, available mortality data or something, you know, not, a, I, I forget, you know, it's, it probably has some, some shortened form of, of uh, you know, a, accounting for the fact that you, know, you can't get, let's say, mortality data in some, in some countries or something like this, right? So, you know, these, these kinds of what we try to do is to try to give a succinct version of, of what we think the, the problems with the data are likely to be. Yes? Yes, uh, Larry Cole from Engineering. Where and where can I see this webcast again? <laughs> the webcast uh, is having some issues. I think we had a bandwidth overload that could not possibly have been predicted. Um, <laughs> but uh, it'll be made available, I think, as soon as possible afterwards. Dan, how soon will you have it available? And about an hour afterwards, from his lips to uh, Skynet's ears. Cyber.law.harvard.edu will have an anchor page pointing to the, uh, uh, to the webcast. Uh, Bill Callahan, Charles River Analytics. Uh, clearly, you're going to have a lot of work to do with curation. But I was wondering, uh, technologically, where do you want to focus in the future? What, what do you mean by technologically? Uh, I mean, um, you, you, you had the, the four components. One of them was curation. But the, uh, the other three, I was wondering, where do you think you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck doing research? I think all four of them need to be pushed forward. Mm -hmm. I think that the, um, uh, you know, they're all, basically, this is a, one thing that I've realized in building the system <coughs> is if you lose any one of those components, you really don't have anything terribly useful. So you have to move all of them forward. I mean, I think that in terms of, uh, what will be some of the, the, the bigger directions? I mean, more, better, faster <laughs> of, of what we have, but, but um, and, and going deeper and deeper into different kinds of data, um, being able to, in some cases, uh, uh, from scratch, remeasure some data, things like this, for some physical kinds of things. Um, another kind of direction is being able to deal with more complicated linguistic uh, inputs, longer things, not just... Uh, you know, 10, 15 words, but, but being able to go, you know, to a couple of lines of text, um, being able to take programs in as input, uh, pieces of pseudocode, and be able to interpret what the pseudocode means and be able to produce uh, program fragments that can then be built on uh, those types of things. Um, uh, being able to take other kinds of input than purely linguistic input. So, for example, raw data input um, or image input, um, these kinds of things. Those are, those are some of the things that we're... Uh, we already have thought of. Typically, what I've found with projects, I mean, actually, I found a terrible thing, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy who does big projects, okay? This is my third big project. But what I've noticed is that uh, it takes me five or ten years, actually, before I actually understand how to take the next steps in a project. I mean, one builds up some paradigm, and then one realizes, you know, given this paradigm, um, uh, it's possible to do all kinds of other things. But at least for me, maybe others, maybe, maybe, Maybe the world will show us faster how to do it, but at least for me, it usually takes a surprising number of years to see sort of what the most important next steps uh, that should be taken are. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Richard Dale. Um, my question is, uh, how do you see this uh, in contrast with um, the semantic web uh, world and uh, the representation of knowledge kind of freely donated and freely tagged uh, right. on the web? and, and both the contribution of that and the understanding of right, that. Right, right, right. So, I mean, you know, for us, if the semantic web had, had completely, had been a 100% sort of overwhelming thing in the world, uh, our project would have been a lot easier, right? If, if, every, if every piece of content on the web had already been semantically tagged and we'd been able to just go around the web and pick things out, you know, this project would have been, would have been vastly easier. I mean, it's worth realizing that a lot of what we have in, in Wolfram Alpha is not just stuff picked from the web. Most of it is from much more systematic databases that are not necessarily even available on the web. Um, but uh, the way I see uh, things, I, I mentioned that, you know, obviously within Wolfram Alpha, we have a, a pretty sophisticated ontology that we're, symbolic ontology that we're using to sort of build up all these concepts and so on. Um, we, that ontology was in a sense not created. I mean, even though I'm a kind of a guy who likes sort of grand schemes for things and so on, we didn't create that ontology as a top-down kind of thing where we just sort of said the world is divided into three parts and they're this, this, and this or something. You know, that ontology is mostly a bottom-up kind of thing where we have all these particular domains. We built an ontology for this domain, that domain, that domain. We realized there was commonality between these ontologies. We kind of merged them together, um, these types of things. 
Um, now, I think that, uh, I hope that as we expose some of our data repository mechanisms, um, that that will help to make it easier to do some kinds of semantic web kinds of things because that will expose some of our ontology mechanisms and, uh, and hopefully those will be able, people will be able to line data and things up according to those uh, sort of ontological mechanisms. Yes. John Crowley at the Kennedy School. Uh, your answer neatly segued into my question. It deals with the ontologies. At what point can we get to look at the formal specifications for each of these ontologies and then moving into the future, at what point can we inject our own ontologies to be able to access the data sets and pull out models that are based on new knowledge? Okay, so, so I mean, the good news about all of this is it's all represented in nice, clean, symbolic Mathematica code. Um, the, uh, you know, our, um, the idea of kind of um, uh, knitting sort of new knowledge into the system, uh, the, the knitting process is a bit complicated because among the other problems, you know, at the end of it, our sort of interface is human natural language and human natural language is surprisingly messy. So for example, one of the things that has to happen when you put a new area in, there are all these new terms for things that go in, right? And some of these terms clash in horrible ways with terms for, you know, like, like a classic bug in this system was when, uh, uh, you know, we're putting in people and there's a, a chap who goes by the name of 50 Cent, okay? And uh, so, you know, that was an example of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we have pretty good systems for picking these things up, but that was kind of an amusing example of where, you know, absolute horror, you know, computations that involved, you know, money, suddenly we're, we're going wrapping and so on. Um, <laughs> But uh, so there are these things where you have to be careful as you knit new knowledge in. Um, and that's, that's not something where, you know, where I expect that we can kind of just uh, let, let loose all of those types of things. But, but in terms of uh, uh, the exposure of sort of ontology stuff, uh, that will happen as soon as we have our kind of data repository mechanism up. People will be able to see pieces of the... the and and are you aspiring to allow people to ask questions within a domain? So if we wanted to hypothesize Texas breaking up into four states, four sub-states, and what would that look like? Is there a way to say, suppose that Texas, as you know it, were replaced by blah 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 now give me the graph of... Gosh. You know. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's pretty hard. You know, a good test here is how many words do you need to use to describe what you're talking about? Mm. If mm. the answer is you know, more than a line's worth, yeah. it's going to be hard for us to, yeah. you know. I mean, maybe a more realistic example is at some point you have to make a call as to whether Palestine exists. And I don't know what reference source you'll use in order to decide, right. but if somebody wanted to see it the other way and say, I want to know about world infant mortality, but presume that Palestine exists. Right. Is so a, so a to... typical example. So what we try to do in cases like this is to say, you know, assuming case A, use case B instead, yes. right? So that's, the, that's our best way. Now the problem is, in, in cases like that of, of aggregated and disaggregated socioeconomic data, the data just doesn't exist. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, you know, there were two countries and they merged, well, two countries merging into one, we can deal with that. One country breaking in two, you go back and try and find the mm. historical data, it just doesn't exist. Mm. And, you know, there's Damn nothing you, you can Czechoslovakia. Do yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so, and you know, I think one of the things that I, I hope will happen is that there are holes in the data and where with enough scholarship and effort you could fill these holes in. And I'm hoping that people will be motivated when, when there are visible holes um, to, to go and figure and out. And I suppose too that, that could suggest that with some form of annotation or optional engine that allow people who happen to have overlapping queries to find each other and communicate about it, you might find communities built around those. Yeah, this I is an interesting question of, of what to what extent we can yeah. sort of build communities and because I think there, there are lots of detailed expert areas here yeah. and there will be people who have you know detailed things to say and yeah. we you know we uh, I don't know you know that the the question of how best to build these kinds of communities very interested in suggestions about this yeah. um, please yes I'm Zach Stone I'm a student here mm -hmm. if you're thinking about 50 cent are you planning to open this up to include more popular information if a bunch of people show up and badly misspell Britney Spears are you interested in helping them well, I'm sure if we type in... They're beyond you know, help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if we, if we said... Uh, I mean, we, we have a certain amount of popular uh, pop, pop culture kind of, kinds of things. What just happened here? But you, you expect to be able to say at least compare the height of Britney Spears and 50 Cent. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's <laughs> Who's true. longer? <laughs> just uh, hold on a second. We, we, um, I'd... Uh, 
Yeah, let's just see. I think you should spell it worse than that. I can try. Yeah, I could try some some strange misspelling, but but yeah, I mean we'll probably. I don't know. Let's try that. Um, okay. Nice. Um, the uh, so in, in terms of popular culture, you know, we, we've we've got um, a certain amount of popular culture information. Um, it's uh, uh, actually, in some sense, popular culture information, insofar as it's computable at all, is much more shallowly computable than all of the scientific kind, than engineering kinds of things. So, in a sense, the mechanisms are much simpler. Like, you know, we can figure out who's related to who genealogically, things like that. We can figure out how tall people are, things of that kind. Um, and I fully expect um, we will, you know, we will have lots of popular culture information. I mean, it gets, uh, oh, you know, there's, there's, there's linguistic horrors. Um, because, you know, if you put in lots of books and music and things like this, a lot of the names of things uh, clash horribly with, with other common concepts. And this ambiguation, which we certainly are capable of doing, um, will, uh, you know, we, we, uh, essentially for, for things that we put in, including, you know, books, people, movies, things like this, there has to be some kind of popularity index that we use that determines the disambiguation. And we actually now have pretty good technology. We use Wikipedia, for example, a lot in the popularity index um, kind of uh, area because you can look at, a, uh, look at a, a person, a thing, whatever in Wikipedia. It's not a, it's not a perfect indication, but it's at least some indication of whether, um, uh, you know, whether if there are lots of incoming links, if there's lots of talk about that person or thing, there's a higher probability that people will actually be, be asking questions about it. And it, you do have some pop culture built into the engine, right? If you ask for the wingspan of an unladen sparrow, does it? Uh... <laughs> yeah, but, that, but, but it'll, it'll certainly, I mean, you know, if, if we type in something, you know, if we, um, you know, if we say something like this, we'll have, uh, um, you know, we'll know something about the, the, um, uh, the movie and we'll know, you know, box office total data and things But I mean, like if this. you ask it meaning of life, it does know the answer to that, right? <laughs> oh, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. I don't know whether it'll do the, it'll do, um, yeah. <laughs> I hate this. This has uh, been a subject of, uh, uh, I, was, I was going to, what I really want to do is actually write an essay. Yeah. <laughs> put it there. I think that's a much more appropriate <laughs> Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Folksonomy. Uh. <laughs> okay, let's see what we say about 42. So it'll tell us some things about 42. Okay, it'll tell us some. Um, okay, no, it's telling us. It's only telling us very, uh, uh, very non-human. Useless things stuff about, like uh, the fifth Catalan number. <laughs> some, yes. John Mueller Liley, um, do you see uh, or envision any uh, integration with something like Psych from? Uh, Psychorp. Right. So, so I mean, Psych is a, is the the sort of most advanced example of a kind of common sense reasoning system, um, and it's sort of interesting to compare what we're doing with Wolfram Alpha with kind of the tradition in AI and common sense reasoning and so on. I mean, the the in a sense uh, sort of what a lot is, of what has gone on there is to try and take what we as humans do when we reason about things and make it kind of computer strength. Um, now. You know, when humans reason about certain kinds of things, they do pretty well. When humans are reasoning about, let's say, some physical process, um, humans, pure human reasoning isn't that great at dealing with figuring out what's going to happen in physics. I mean, this was kind of the, the big idea of Galileo and Newton and so on 300 years ago was you don't just have to do natural philosophy by thinking about things. You can uh, roll up your mathematics and sort of blast your way through and get to answers. So we're in the, in the Newtonian, Galilean kind of tradition of just you know, blast your way through to an answer kind of thing using uh, you know, the best sort of whatever it is, math, algorithm, whatever tools to, to get to those answers. Um, so how does that relate to kind of common sense reasoning? I think that uh, uh, we will provide a, a very good basis for sort of wrapping much sort of more powerful common sense reasoning because we can actually, we can do the non-human parts of the reasoning really well. Um, and so if there are people who have a good, you know, a good leg up on doing the human parts, they, it will be possible to, to merge those in an interesting way and uh, uh, hope to be able to see that as an application of our API. Let's see. Yes. Hi. I'm Mako, Benjamin Mako Hill. So, I mean, I guess uh, a lot of people ask questions about the data, so I'll ask one about the, about the code. Uh, you mentioned that one of the benefits would be uh, that, that when people have to go and, you know, solve these problems themselves, they often do it wrong. So you've written six million, five to six million lines of, 
clean Mathematica code, but presumably there's some, uh, uh, there are a few mistakes in there as well. Yes. And um, uh, so one of the too many issues that I'm involved with is reproducible um, science and sort of advocating for that. And the, the standard there seems to be that you sort of provide the code and people can sort of look in them. Is there, is there any sort of analog in here or are we just sort of to trust that this has been done correctly? Right, well, so I mean, we, we've got uh, in different worlds, so for example, you know, with, with Mathematica, one of the great things is that the code tends to be succinct enough that you can actually read it. And, you know, for example, we have this big thing, the demonstrations project, okay, which is a, a project about sort of contributing interactive uh, um, demonstrations of things using, using Mathematica. This is the 4,740 of these things now um, as of today. Uh, so this is a case where there's, there's great value to being able to sort of succinctly read little pieces of code that do things. Um, in terms of, of Ultram Alpha, um, in terms of Mathematica itself, um, you know, what we try to do is to do sort of the best QA that we can. And um, in a sense, what we've learned is at various times in the history of Mathematica, we made available big swaths of source code, um, you know, big swaths of Mathematica code. Actually, for a decade, we used to ship um, kind of the, the code that underlay um, a lot of our calculus computations in Mathematica. And the sad fact was that nobody read it. I mean, it was very frustrating because a lot of effort went into actually making that code clean enough that we thought we could expose it to people, but nobody read it. So why not? Well, there was a lot of effort to read it, but also a lot of these kinds of computations, it's better to look at the result and check it and you know, run test cases and so on rather than to go and try and read this code. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the same, the same issue comes up uh, you know, with uh, one of the things that's, you know, people say, well, you know, just show me it as a theorem, so to speak. You know, show me that, that you know, prove that you've got the right answer, let's say, in Mathematica for, for math kinds of things. You know, prove that you've got the right answer. You know, synthesize a kind of uh, a human readable theorem. Well, um, actually, the state of the art of synthesizing human readable theorems isn't that good yet. Um, but, uh, um, you know, typically machine generated proofs um, are you know, just full of steps, all of which actually make sense, but the whole thing is, is completely un, un kind of co not cognitively uh, sort of uh, accessible to a person. Um, the, uh, the thing that one realizes at some point is humans reading this are vastly less efficient than automated quality assurance methods trying to check pieces of the, what's going on. So, you know, our, our emphasis has been sort of do the best sort of QA that we can run as many test cases, and then let people have the kind of uh, the behavioral sort of aspects of the code and, and just run it and so on. Which is not to say that, that we won't make available, uh, if there's some particular area where there's some particularly interesting, you know, computation. Actually, having said that, for example, things like the, the formulas that Wolfram Alpha uses to compute things, you usually can just ask it, and it will show you the formula that it uses to compute something. I mean, when it's in deeper levels of code, I mean, you know, if, if it's going and solving, you know, if I type in some, you know, random, uh, um, I do love the way that I can type this stuff in absolutely cruddy notation. Let's see, see if it understood that. Okay, you know, I type in some random nonlinear differential equation. Um, uh, you know, this is not the code that is making, that is solving that differential equation. I guarantee this is a huge amount of code. Um, and there's nothing, you know, it would be a, a work of, uh, you know, it's, it's many PhD thesis worth of work to go through and figure out what on earth all this code is, is, uh, um, is doing. And it's not something that- But you don't have a philosophical is. objection to release it. <laughs> the, the pieces of code, no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a, you know, particularly when it comes to particular kinds of computations that we're doing, um, you know, our, our pride of, of thing is not the models. The models are, you know, coming from the world. Mm. Our, you know, our pride of thing is integrating all this stuff. And, and uh, as I say, in, in many cases, let's see, if we, if we ask something like, you know, I don't know, a pendulum, let's try, you know, a, a five centimeter pendulum, for example, um, it'll probably tell me, okay, so it'll give me some results here, and somewhere it'll say, come on, wake up here, there we go, okay. Um, someplace it'll say, you know, there's a thing that says show formula here. So in this case, I can go and say, you know, the, the formula for a pendulum is quite simple, but it might be, there might be a much more complicated formula for something that you would similarly be able to get displayed there. Yes? Is this going to be integrated into Mathematica? Right now, you can get a lot of data on six and seven, but this, this right. sounds so, pretty good. Right, so the, the, um, what will happen is, in a future version of Mathematica, um, you'll actually be able to type sort of Wolfram Alpha input 
into Mathematica in sort of a special mode. I think it'll be a, you type an equal sign at the beginning of the line, you start typing it in. It'll, it'll then be able to do the linguistic analysis stuff from Wolfram Alpha. It'll go and send the stuff out to the Wolfram Alpha servers, get the results back. They'll come back in these pods inside Mathematica. You then get to sort of press the, uh, some button on these pods to use the computation um, that uh, uh, was, um, uh, that, that, that came back from, from the system. So yes, it will be, it will be, I think there'll be a quite nice kind of integration. We can just take temperature since we're at the bottom of the uh, hour here. We can, we can extend out a little bit, but how many people still have questions they're eager to ask? Just a, not that many. And how many have uh, queries they want to suggest run? Okay, a couple of those. So maybe we can uh, take the questions and if you've got queries you're thinking of, end yeah. with a round of some sample searches. Please. Hi, uh, it's Jonathan from MIT. Um, I just wondered how much more work you've got to do on the natural language processing side of it, because it certainly seemed that in a lot of the search terms you used, there was a fairly sort of specialist lexicon of uh, phrases, uh, symbols that perhaps wouldn't be naturally apparent to the public. Right, so I mean, the, you know, how much work do we have to do, we don't know. Okay, it's as simple as that. I mean, we, we look, you know, there's a, we're running a bunch of small tests of the system right now, and we are looking, you know, there is a daily splat log, which means things that fail, right? And we look at, through the things that fail. We try to figure out why did they fail? Did they fail because it's, the, it's just a type of query that is not the kind of thing we deal with? Is it failing because we don't have a particular kind of domain? Is it failing because we didn't understand the linguistic aspects of it? Here's what I've noticed. Um, the, the pure linguistic fluffery, as we call it, which is, you know, the extra words that people put in saying, you know, what is the value of such and such? Um, you know, we, we're pretty good at removing linguistic fluff. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to be careful when you remove linguistic fluff because you have to make sure that there wasn't a word like, you know, there wasn't a critical, some critical uh, grammatical structure inside the linguistic fluff. Um, and uh, the, um, so we're pretty good at removing that. Um, the, uh, the most, what, what tends to happen when you look at people interacting with the system is uh, at first they may ask things in a, in a very fluffy form with, with lots of extra words and so on, but pretty soon they get lazy and they say, I don't need all those extra words. Let me just type in the thing that I would say if I was talking to somebody who really knew about this particular area, just the key things that they need to know. As soon as they get to that point, we don't even need to do this defluffing. And you know, the things I was typing in, just because I wasn't wanting to type a lot, bunch of extra words, um, were, uh, you know, looked, might look a little bit cryptic, but that, you know, the, what, what, we see, what seems to happen is that people quickly uh, tend to type in just the concepts as they think about them. The word order is irrelevant, the grammatical structures are crummy, um, it's just a bunch of concepts. It's kind um, of the opposite of Ask Jeeves. It's like just emote at Jeeves. Yes, yeah. yes, right. I mean, you know, I think from a sort of linguistic theory point of view, you know, we're much more seeing the kind of deep structure of language, the kind of ways people think about things, than we are seeing the surface structure of, of nicely formed English sentences and so on. But, you know, this question of how much further do we have to go in linguistic analysis, we don't know. I mean, it's as simple as that. The, the um, you know, it, it's, uh, um, uh, and we certainly, um, uh, you know, depending on the domain, uh, there's sort of a, a sub-language that happens in, for example, mathematics. That's its own quite complicated thing where there are all these different ways to say things and, uh, and so on. And you know, we've done, in the mathematics domain and, and things related to mathematics, I think we've done a really good job of capturing the complete you know, language that any human would understand. Um, in some areas where there are lots of words and lots of different uh, nuances of meaning, um, it's more difficult. And you know, don't, don't know how difficult it will end up being. Yes. The, um, I'm Peter Olson, the Free Software Foundation. I'm particularly interested in how this changes the landscape relating to public access to knowledge, because the, it seems there's a great deal of information uh, in journals, which um, some process has to occur in order to uh, free that up so it can be used in your system. Could you comment on that? Well, so in terms of, of journals and so on, I mean, you know, typically we're just reading these papers and things. I mean, so, you know, it, it's uh, what what, um, you know, when there is systematic material uh, that um, has been accumulated somewhere, let's say a proprietary database of some kind, you know, the big challenge for us is, you know, make the right deals so that we can get that proprietary database into the system. I mean, that's, that's really the, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the thing that has to happen. 
Um, in terms of, you know, have we been successful in making these deals? Yeah, we've been pretty successful. Um, you know, and by uh, into the system, you mean also able to be taken out of the system by the casual user of Wolfram Alpha? Well, okay, so there, there are problems here because, you know, in the current state of the world, right, there are, you know, people go to a lot of trouble to assemble these things, and we may be able to convince people that, you know, it's okay to have it be casually accessible in the system, particularly if they're in the source information and so on. But to say, well, gee, then, you know, can somebody just take the thing that we just put a huge amount of effort into assembling mm -hmm. and just lift it all and take it out, you know, the answer will be no. Um, mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's not, uh, and better that we be able to give everybody access to particular pieces of data and then, but, but, you know, with the understanding that they're not going to be able to lift the whole thing out, um, then that we say, no, 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 we don't want to touch anything where you can't lift mm. the whole thing out, so let's just not give people mm. access to any of it. Um, mm. But that's a, you know, I don't know all of the, you know, we, we have yet to learn all of the issues that are going to come up with this. Mm. Um, you know, right now, I think it's, it's uh, I've been very sort of pleasantly actually surprised um, by the extent to which, uh, uh, people have been very, very uh, sort of cooperative and practical about what we're doing. This fellow out of your field of view. Has I'm been sorry, please. Yes. Christoph Schwertfinger from the Kennedy School. Um, I wonder, you say all sorts of data, and I'm looking for the philosophical and not the practical answer. Um, there's a lot of individual data around that is semi-public, or if you get access to priority database. So will at some point I say, okay, who of the relatives of Christoph Schwertfinger can pay their rent? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a nasty problem. I mean, so, you know, for me, you know, what we're dealing with is publicly accessible data, genuinely public data, you know, data on public companies, data on, you know, things that are, you know, in the public record, well, they, they, very public data. Now, for example, one of the issues is things like people search, right? And we, we know we could do a bunch of stuff there. We know we could line up a bunch of databases. We could do a really good job. Personally, I don't really want to. Okay? Because right now, the state of these things is, it's still, you know, if, if I look myself up on a people search thing, there'll be 15 copies of me. And that's kind of, you know, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's sort of good. Because there's sort of the information, you know, there's public records information, but it's kind of a little messy. Um, you know, probably with the technology we have, one could make it much more precise. Personally, I'm not keen to do that. Um, I don't think that. But, you know, people, uh, I don't know how that will evolve and how the visibility of technology like this will cause you know, other people to think about doing those kinds of things. But you know, that's my personal you know, preference in, in terms of that, that type of thing. Um, and and uh, in, in, you know, what we're trying to do, as I say, um, there's a lot of very good, genuinely public information out there. It is not our goal to kind of burrow into stuff that, uh, that I would prefer not to see burrowed into. Yes? I'm Sam Lipoff, a graduate student in chemistry at MIT. Um, I feel like people have been dancing around a, a question a little bit because we are here at the Berkman Center, this bastion of open source and free culture. And so this is a, a proprietary system running on your own servers with your own employees. And so I, I'm wondering what you think of a sort of more Wikipedia-like model. I can see reasons not to have it, but on the other hand, I would say that, you know, as a chemist who sometimes wants very specialized data and sometimes has it, I might be a little upset if I have to pay you to put my own data in. And you might be a little inundated if everybody who wants to give you good data, you have to spend a lot of time curating. Do you worry about some competitor coming and making a wiki data that's completely open and growing much faster, for example? That'd be great. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, you know, our goal, look, what we've done, making this thing is not especially easy. And it has many parts. It isn't just a question of, you know, shovel a bunch of data in, and then it will all come alive. You know, th these, uh, uh, one of the challenges, for example, if I look at Wikipedia today, um, Wikipedia is a fantastic achievement. It's very useful. I use it all the time. Um, but it, it uh, you know, it, it has gone in particular directions. Um, and, for example, a, a common observation is um, when you, uh, if, if you are looking for some systematic data in Wikipedia, somebody may have put... Um, you know, systematic data. Some, somebody may have, for example, loaded up, um, you know, some properties of some particular kind of chemical. They may have, you know, put 300 of these things. Who knows if they're laundering somebody else's IP or that kind of thing, but they anyway, they put 300, you know, properties of 300 chemicals very nice and consistently into 300 pages in Wikipedia. Then over the course of the next two years, 
people who thought they knew better went and modified you know, 200 of those pages in fairly random ways that might have been an improvement, might not have been an improvement, but the result is that there's no consistency left. And when you try and you know, compute from that, you're pretty much sunk. And as I say, for us, um, the, uh, uh, you know, Wikipedia is the most useful thing about Wikipedia is the folk information that you get from it, of what's popular, what are typical names for things. You know, New York is also called the Big Apple, something you wouldn't find in government sources, um, those types of things. I mean, in terms of, you know, is there a way, I mean, what we have here is uh, something that is not just a, you shovel data in, you also have to have all these real-time feeds for data. You have to have things that sort of compute with the data. You know, I, I've certainly thought, you know, how do we, you know, how can we kind of franchise out what we have in some way? It's, it's, it's not so easy to see because it isn't just, okay, here's a lump of data. Now go add to that data. It's here's a lump of data and all these real-time feeds and all these arrangements with people who are providing real-time feeds and here's all this computation that we have to do and here's all this linguistics that we have to put in and pretty soon you're reproducing the whole thing. And by the way, it's free anyway. So it's kind of not, um, uh, you know, you're, you're reproducing something that is a, a um, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that, you know, what I'm, what I'm interested in doing is because I think it's a, that's a worthwhile thing and it makes, I think it's uh, a nice thing for my project number three is to sort of make accessible to the world for free just tons and tons of, of knowledge and, and, and information and, and computation. I mean, in terms of your, your question of whether, um, whether there'll come a point at which we are completely inundated by people trying to feed things into the system, um, uh, you know, that's a, that's a complicated economic, technical, and other question. Um, the thing that is encouraging to me in terms of that is, uh, you know, we've built pretty good automated sort of uh, automated curation pipelines and things. We've got pretty good procedures. I think we can withstand a significant scaling up of the rate of, of data being absorbed by the system. Um, in terms of uh, um, uh, will, um, well, let's see. I mean, the, the uh, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I like to believe that there's sort of an ecosystem that develops. If people find this useful and people, um, you know, then there's ways that we can support the effort to sort of scale up having more things be put in. I also think that if you actually want this to work well, that it is very hard to achieve that by having sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, 10,000 people just sort of all feed little random pieces in. There is, I know, because I've been doing it, there is a need for sort of central leadership to the thing, to actually have a consistent system um, that where all the pieces fit together. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's something that is very hard to achieve in kind of a, a wiki kind of fashion. As we start to wrap up, are there any interesting uh, queries from our online feeds of various kinds? Amar or Domishta? I didn't mean to surprise you. A lot have been covered. And are there any search queries, as long as we've got an instance of this up and running, that people wanted to try out? Is it worth it to do a few here, you know, from the front row? Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Who it is? Won't know. It, it won't know. It won't know. I, uh, Did you ask it for a map of a cat? Map of what? <laughs> map of a cat. A oh, map of a cat. Is that a Dr. Seuss reference? Oh, 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 <laughs> it shows you my I'm reading sure list. it won't. Uh, no, it, it uh, <laughs> hopeless. It, it, uh, this is what you need to know. <laughs> right. No, I mean. Uh, so that's an example, probably, of, of uh, uh, that's what I would call. Um, uh, it's what I like to refer to as artificial stupidity. Okay. I that think is, it did it, know the wingspan of an unlegged sparrow. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it knows that. Yeah. Right, it'll, it'll know a lot of sort of folk information like that. But yeah. but if this is a if this is a cultural reference, which I don't happen to know, but. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it does not yet know anatomy. It knows, it knows, it's beginning to know a fair amount about, it knows about drugs, it knows about diseases. Um, it doesn't happen to know anatomy yet. Um, the, uh, but this is an example, I mean, uh, you know, this is a little bit horrifying, but, but um, uh, this is an example where, um, of what can happen when, you know, it has a certain set of concepts and it's trying very, very hard um, to figure something out. And it concluded that there's some Australian company and uh, Caterpillar, a company in the US. Yes, there is a way to do that. Uh, a question, how real time are your data when you say you have uh, real time feeds? Uh, take a stock, say Microsoft, MSFT. Yep. Is it uh, the daily closes? Is it the 20 minute uh, delayed one minute prices? Or is it the tick data? 
<laughs> it is, okay, so what we have is, um, I think it'll be about one minute delayed probably. So it says one minute ago. So this is, the, this is the feed from the exchanges. Now, of course, there's all kinds of plumbing necessary to make that happen. Yes, we've got the, that plumbing done. We don't have intraday, tick-by-tick -tick data. We have the, the real-time data coming in. Um, th there's some limitations from exchanges about what we can present for free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Long story. But it does suggest that one artifact of this going public might be lots of people coming up with odd juxtapositions or comparisons the yes. uh, an increase in the tax on fishing trawlers with the amount of fishing in a particular country. Right. That yeah, so, see, I mean, one of the things, what, okay, so one thing that I have to say about when this goes live um, is, you know, one of my greatest concerns is the a high density of what I might call novelty queries, okay, which are really not the point. I mean, we could spend a huge amount of effort covering lots of novelty queries and that would it would be it would be lots of fun, but after the novelty <coughs> dies down, then we're left with people who actually want to use this, mm. you know, many times a day every day. And in, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's probably the place where you know we. But uh, of course, I, unusual I, juxtapositions may not be novelty. No, absolutely. They may be novel. They may be, they may be, that's as correct. compared to sparrow wingspans and yeah, stuff exactly. like that. Yeah, exactly. No, right. I mean, and that would be you know that's will be of great interest. I mean, this is yeah. you know I will be fascinated to read you know, some of these particularly splat logs of, of you know, things that didn't work and, uh, you know, yeah. see, what's, uh, um, see what kinds of things people think of. Yes. Uh, just as you talk about this, I wonder uh, how will you feel if Google starts to present your results as one of yeah. their responses to questions the way they present the Wikipedia results and, and, uh, and other facts? They will present the MSFT quote and then a bunch of other um, Right. I mean, found. you know, obviously we're working, you know, to partner with sort of all possible organizations that make sense and, you know, search, narrative, news, you know, all these kinds of things are somewhat complementary to what we have. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be some great uh, uh, sort of uh, um, synergies that exist there. I mean, as a practical matter, um, you know, you've got to realize that this isn't, we are generating things on the fly. So we're not, this isn't, I mean, even if we wanted it to be the case, and we might, that we could say, okay, let's expose this to search engines. What are we going to expose? You know, we could start generating, you know, a quadrillion pages on the web. So, so the best you could hope for is actually, you know, Wolfram, might, uh, Wolfram Alpha may know the answer to this. Click here. Yes. That's, that's one right. of the options. Right. So, so I mean, the, one of the things that we will see is there is this question of pre-scanning uh, generic, for example, the generic search queries, right? And asking, does Wolfram Alpha have a chance, right? Uh, we actually have, yeah, we have some pretty good ideas about how to fast pre-scan um, kind of the generic stream to see what, uh, un, in what cases we, we have a chance. I mean, a, a, very, a very obvious heuristic is if it's got numbers in it. That's a, you know, that's a place where, um, you know, we have a, a chance. One of um, the questions this has naturally led to for me is thinking about whether the great universities and libraries of the world see this kind of enterprise as like beneath them. It's mere aggregation of facts and number crunching or way too far above them. They couldn't possibly afford to do anything so comprehensive. And um, to me, trying to find some sweet spot where .edu and .org can find a role here in this ambitious uh, project, um, that's to me one of the enduring questions. That's a really interesting questions. question. Right, it's a really yeah. interesting question. I mean, I think that you know, what has tended to happen you know, in academia is that uh, the accumulation of data, while in fact extremely useful for the world, has in the, pre in the last 50 years or so kind of slid below, you know, to sort of the below uh, what, what is considered kind of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what, you know, good academic, you know, feathers or something. Right. Um, and that's sort of a shame because, you know, often the aggregation of hard, you know, data is a hell of a lot more useful for the world than another kind of um, opinion piece, so to speak, mm. generated mm. in some particular area. Mm. And I think it's a shame that, that it has not been, you know, it hasn't tended to be academically respectable to, to go out and um, sort of uh, just, you know, study pieces of data. I mean, at different times in history, there have been different kinds of things, like, you know, when chemistry was young, for example, I think it was the case that people just went out and, you know, they looked at every possible, you know, chemical, and I think that was, that was, it was certainly commercially uh, uh, respectable. I think it was also academically respectable. Right. Um, the, uh, in terms of libraries, um, 
I, I, I think you're right that in that case, this tends to be, you know, this is much too kind of uh, computer complicated for the typical current sort of library situation. I mean, it's been interesting. I, you know, as we've uh, as we've talked to people about Wolf and Alpha, I've been kind of curious. What are the historical antecedents? You know, what, what um, uh, you know, or, or even though the technology might not have existed, you know, what what sort of got close to this in the past? And I think that the um, there obviously have been lots of library efforts, encyclopedia efforts. Um, actually, you know, Leibniz basically had this nailed. Um, you know, he had the idea of you know. Uh, we can take sort of any human argument and we can find sort of a, a way to mechanically, computationally work out the answer to the argument. And he was making mechanical calculator type things and so on. And then he was going around convincing the princes of his time to go and try and assemble giant libraries so you could feed the information into the machine and so on. And he, you know, he had, he had the idea. The only problem was he was 300 years too early. Mm. Um, but, mm. uh, you know, so this is... Um, but yes, I think the, the, the question you ask is really interesting, and I, mm. I, I've, I've thought about it a certain amount, mm. and uh, uh, it would be, be a great topic to, to talk further about. So this bridge to the 17th century will be completed, when do we go live? <laughs> yeah, right, well, a few weeks, a few weeks. It's, it's, uh, it's a question of, um, uh, there'll be even, I, I hope, the going live event will be actually, we'll see. We'll see if we really, if we really have the, um, nerve to do this will actually be a live webcast thing. Oh, wow. Well, we so, know how well that works. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings to those out on the webcast and to those who will uh, hear the podcast that will shortly follow. Please join me in thanking Stephen Wolfram. For